Every day, you essentially pay your dues by doing the harder thing when it's the right thing to do. We're good. Carrie, how are you? I am good. How are you? Doing good. I really appreciate your time. Thank you for being here. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I know we cannot have enough information around proper nutrition and actually dealing with some of these topics that people are a little nervous to talk about. <laughs> yeah, I find it gets a little sensitive and people don't want to definitely don't want to talk about it, but it's a conversation that needs to be had. Yeah. Uh, first of all, I know we're missing regionals right now, which I apologize. I didn't think about that before we recorded the time, but I didn't either, but ESPN, right. They, uh, they archive everything so we can, yeah. we can watch later. Not the timestamp, but did you watch yesterday for like planes? Bits and pieces. I actually like to follow Temple, so I was a bit crushed over that. Oh, that, no. that didn't happen. I know. It's funny. This but. time of year, the two sports I really only watch are like college basketball for March Madness. Uh, the neutral, mm -hmm. I follow no team, and then college gymnastics. And tomorrow, it's like gymnastics all day, I and then college gymnastics. It's everything. It's great. Yeah. And the men have their conference championships this yep. weekend, too. Yeah, so yeah. that may be that may be on in my, my house as well. We'll see. Yeah. I, uh, I have a special place in my heart for a lot of teams. We have some athletes at champion who come and like do strength training with us or our medical like patients of mine. So like, I don't know, I'm torn when I see like a play and where like people from both sides are there, or I see like a competition where we know people from both teams. I'm like, I just want everyone to win. Everyone can win. Mm -hmm. Everybody <laughs> in. <laughs> um, yeah, we'll record it and watch it later. Um, However, I wanted to talk to you about a lot of things. Uh, there's so many things that we could dive into, but something that I think is um, on a lot of people's minds right now is our film about body image and our film about, uh, you know, how these things come up in our culture. And I think, you know, I talked to Christina and Josh and, and other people about it, but I think you have a really valuable perspective as a nutritionist and as someone who was in gymnastics and has so much stuff going on. And so I guess that's where I want to start is I... I I think you had a great little snippet in the film about you know, where these things come from. And I think that the offhanded comment or, you know, the culture itself sometimes sparks these things. And I think coaches and parents and medical providers maybe underappreciate how devastating some of these things can be. And so I'd like to start there about maybe your experiences working with athletes around body image and where you feel like these things maybe spark from, and we can kind of roll from there. Yeah, absolutely. I think this really comes from two places. Like you said, it's it's a big culture piece of the sport. So part of it seems to have just ingrained itself in the sport. Um, and then a lot of that, again, is very external. And it can come from some of these outside places or some of these um, unintended places. Like mm -hmm. you said, an offhanded comment, something you know said or done that wasn't intended to harm. But it causes a spiral. So I think, you know, there's been a lot of people and a lot of time spent looking back mm. um, in where we've come from. So I think I know I've, I've definitely heard it on your podcast before. I think was it the heavy metals on ESPN? They did a really good job of diving into it as well. Um, and really just seeing how gymnastics itself moved from, you know, women to children, mm. right? We took the exception and turned it into the model for success. Um, so just just having that expectation that gymnasts are young, gymnasts are small, and they're supposed to stay that way to be, you know, easily coached, e easily spotted, easily maneuvered, and of course, right, easily controlled by that, that mm. egocentric coach, yep. which was ever present you know, in the, in the seventies and eighties and nineties and, you know, less so today, but still there. Um, I think with gymnastics so much, we see it in coaching, we see it in medicine, we see it in, in everything for so long. It was just about talking about and doing things the way that they were always done. Right. My coach did, a, did this, said this to me. So this is in turn how I'm going to coach and because it worked for me or, you know, did maybe didn't work for me. Yeah. Um, but at that point, really, you know, it's not, it's, it's like the coach. Sorry, I'm like trying to collect my thoughts. Um, so like the coaches were expected to play all of these roles, right? They were supposed to be the teacher of the skills, the routine construction. They were supposed to be the strength coach and the PT and the nutritionist. Mm -hmm. And 
you know, you can't really blame them for doing the best that they could with the knowledge and the education that we had, that they had. Um, so I think just for so long, we were stuck in this, in this model of, okay, let's keep gymnasts small because the best gymnasts on the international stage are small. And we're going to do this by starving them and we're going to do this by withholding food and withholding water and you know blaming everything on their body when in reality we probably need to take a step back and we need to look at the bigger picture and say okay what's really going on and and what are we trying to do and what are we trying to control mm. um, i think that really sets a lot of gymnasts today um up with these unrealistic standards mm. and unrealistic expectations even if it's not so much the reality anymore um, there's just still this idea that gymnasts have to look a certain way they have to have a certain body type um, and when you know a gymnast turns 15 16 17 and they can't physically be that anymore because that's not how biology works yeah, yeah. it's it's this constant um, like I've failed the expectations and I can't live up to the standards. Like, what can I do? What can I control? Yeah, um, I, I, I agree. I think that the, the, the concept around body image, and, and this is my experience as a male in the sport who has not grown up as a female in the sport, obviously, but I think we start to culturally set really, really unrealistic, unrelenting standards. And I think that they're not malicious. I just think that they're like, they're, they're a constant moving target. It's never good enough. And I think people maybe on the backbone of like coaching skills about like, Oh, like straighten your legs. You're like, now do it like this. Like sometimes, sometimes kids do things perfect. And we're like, okay, now do the next skill, you know? And it's like, we don't really reward them for like, Hey, that, that actually is really good. Good job. You know, great. That is a great turn. And I think sometimes they internalize that to become like, okay, well now I have to, like you said, look a certain way. I have to have this certain line. I have to have some sort of thing. And they go through natural growth and they, they develop these insane, unrealistic standards, which become internalized. And I think in my experiences with a few athletes who struggle with this and myself as well, it becomes like, it doesn't matter what the scale says, it's never low enough. It doesn't matter how much I work out, it's I got to go for more hours. It doesn't matter how much I restrict or how much I do this, I got to be more clean, I got to be more this and more that. And you just you're constantly dodging a, a, like the, the, the in, impossible target. Exactly. And the thing with body image, is most of the time it actually has nothing to do with the body with their body mm. itself they're looking for a scapegoat or something to blame instead of digging into the deeper issue so like you said that fear of failure that um or what happens if i'm not perfect mm. a lot of times right in gymnastics it's such an aesthetic sport we're constantly judging skills and routines and straight legs and pointed toes but that line between judging the skill and judging the sport and judging the person, mm. especially for a young kid can really get blurred. Mm. Um, and young kids have a hard time differentiating, you know, okay, that skill maybe didn't go the way it's planned, but it has nothing to do with me as a person. Mm. Um, and yeah, go ahead. And I just say on that, I think this is naturally this happens in teenage kids is that they want to fit in, they want to have teammates, but also they are comparing themselves already to everybody around them and their teammates and their friends and stuff like that. And I think unfortunately, sometimes a mistake we make as coaches is that we inadvertently compare kids versus each other in a gymnastics point of view. And that starts to become a comparison of skill performance. And then it morphs into a comparison of what this person is looking like or doing. And I think of many horrible stories that I've heard of kids lighting life, like, well, like, we all need to look like Susie, you know what I mean? Like Susie is, is, is really in charge of what she's eating, and she's sleeping well, and she's performing well, we need to be better about this. And like, man, talk about the avalanche of mental health that comes alongside of that. Um, is that is that I think many people think like, Oh, that was the 80s, they don't do that anymore. They don't weigh people anymore. But I don't know, I think a lot of people still unfortunately are dealing with those situations here in 2021. And I'm curious if in your experiences, you hear some of those stories that are still existing in the culture. Oh, yeah, it's definitely still happening. I think the biggest thing that I've heard recently, especially with COVID, um, is comparing the gymnasts to themselves pre quarantine. Mm. So um, I, basically, every family, every parent, every gymnast, every coach that I've talked to said their kids had growth spurts during the quarantine, whether they were out of the gym for four weeks or if they were out of the gym for four months, 
right? The kids grew, they changed, you know, that little time off was just enough to, to be opportunistic for so many of these kids to, to spurt through puberty. Mm. Um, and that's been really, really tough for a lot of kids as well. Um, just that comparison to an old version of themselves. Mm. Like they were, they left the gym, they were shorter, they were smaller, you know, their body was a little bit different. And then they came back and all of a sudden, like things are hard now. Right. And instead of understanding, okay, you know, when was the last time you took four months off of gymnastics? Probably never. Right. right? We've got to take this slow things, you know, things aren't just going to come back. It's not like soccer or basketball where you can just, you know, pick up the ball and start shooting again and basically be right, right where you left off. Right. So many of these skills weren't practiced at home. Um, and so many coaches, of course, just tried to uh, rush their kids right back to where they were. That again, it's going back to those unrealistic expectations and um, that were that were set for themselves and figuring out, OK, what can I control and, you know, what's going to make me feel better? Yeah, because it's a lot easier to to say like, OK, let me just eat different or eat less or cut cut out sugar, whatever it is, instead of doing that that hard thinking and that deep work, um, trying to figure out what's actually different or what's actually bothering them at this point. Yeah. And I, the elephant in the room, unfortunately, is, is this, we're, you know, almost in the middle of competition season right now is I, on, on the injury side, I saw this happen a ton too, is that, you know, took four months off. And again, I'm someone who talks about the need to have a relative off season. And I think what we did was way too much. I think it was like some kids are out of gym for four or five months and that's just, it's unrealistic. I think it's going to go well. But, um, you know, I watched people return back and we published some guidelines, you know, USAG, you know, people had some guidelines about how to safely return back, Eh, whatever, we'll kind of go at our own pace. They kind of skipped through, you know, it was supposed to be like an eight to 10 week slow return. And people were like, nah, we're going to start doing skills like second week, you know, and like, okay, Mm -hmm. we we missed a hurdle there. And then also this, like, I know kids want to compete. I know it's fun. They want a goal to train for. I totally understand it. But like some people I saw rushing back to trying to compete and I don't know why, whether it was they wanted to do it or there was financial or they wanted what was they thought it was best for the kids. I am treating so many kids with injuries because they rushed mm-hmm. back to full competitions and they just weren't ready. They just didn't have enough time to get their skills back safely and get conditioned again and feel confident in their skills. And I'm feeling as though that is a very similar tie-in to maybe what you're experiencing with things change, man. Bodies change. People change. Uh, welcome to the reality of living in a pandemic that happens every 100 years and Maybe this year is a little bit of a wash. Maybe we're only going to compete twice in house, and it's going to be it is it's like why are we pushing so hard to make all these competitions like eight or nine competitions? Like it's crazy in my opinion. Yeah, no, I I totally agree. Um, I even had some conversations with these coaches. Like, imagine what you could could have done with eighteen months. Like, if you didn't have to put a gymnast in front of a judge for eighteen months, because that's honestly what it was almost looking like at yeah. that point. Like, what could you do? What could you focus on? Um, You know, all those little those little things in the gym that you never have time to get around to doing to fixing. Like, yeah, there was so much time Mm. in this opportunity just to to take a different approach and try things differently. Um, And some people did. I've definitely seen it. And then some people just went right back to that, you know, broken, rusty, squeaky wheel. (laughs) Yeah, I think that it, uh, we can't change the past, unfortunately, but it should be a very harsh lesson in how do we approach the off season coming up and how do we think about what are we going to do differently moving forward in relation to working with nutritionists, working with mental health providers, working with strength coaches, you know, planning these things in advance. And that was a, a, a question I wanted to bring up to you is I think a lot of coaches, like you said, rightfully are juggling too many things. I think that they're trying, whether they're trying to be, or they're being forced to be, you know, they're talking about mental health, they're talking about strength conditioning, they're talking about nutrition, they're talking about all this kind of stuff. I think we put too much on coaches sometimes and don't really have an empathetic point of view to what they go towards. Um, But it's challenging for them maybe to even have that conversation. So say somebody does come back and they're not as the same as they were before quarantine as a coach, like, what do you, how do you even address that topic? How do you even talk about it when someone's like, oh, my back starts to hurt or like, you know, I just, 
like I had this, I was like, I just feel heavy right now. And as a guy, I'm like, I don't want to talk about this. Like, I don't know how to dance this dance professionally right now. Um, what are your, what are your pieces of advice me for coaches who are going through those moments in the gym where athletes organically talk about these things? Yeah. I mean, I think it's, it's really about getting down to that root issue and that deeper issue and having a gym wide understanding of what's going on and, and not saying that the coach or anyone has to know everything, mm. but when the lines of communication are very open, right. And it, and that's a big culture piece, whether it's between the coaches and the staff and the gymnasts and the families and the parents and just as best as possible, right. Keeping everybody on the same page of, you know, okay, not only like, what are we doing in the gym and what's going on and what's the, you know, the competition season, um, what phase are we in? But like, okay, with everything that's gone on, like, what are you struggling with? You know, what are, what are the expectations? Like, is it realistic to have the same expectations of yourself mm -hmm. today as six months ago? Yeah. Um, I know you talk a lot about like goals shifting and making sure that training plans are aligned with goals. And sometimes, you know, we've got to pivot a little bit if things are just not quite feeling right. Right. You know, having and and it doesn't always have to come from the coach, but having these tougher conversations where everyone's on board of of just understanding what's happening. Right. Maybe it's bringing in a, a physician or somebody to talk about puberty right in in age groups with the kids and the parents and, you know, what's happening and what's going on. Um, just so they have that understanding of like, OK, my body's changed a little bit. It's not a bad thing. It's a natural thing. Um, it's something that, you know, I can, I can work through. I can learn to grow through, um, but it's going to take time. So I think as we continue just having the, the professional conversations and making sure the coaches don't always have to be the one to speak on that. Yeah. Yeah. That's very important. And I think also too, something I've learned from, you know, people like yourself and others is that like, while as a coach, I can't obviously suggest anything i can't you know make any recommendations i can listen and hear that people are in need of more information or want help with these certain things and as a coach i can try to re refer to people that i know that are trustworthy or you know provide some educational resources in a, in a way that's not you know judgmental or you know calling somebody out but saying like okay i hear that people are curious about you know how much i should sleep or like what snacks can i make or you know all this other kind of stuff you know, here's a bunch of stuff that I know, or I'm going to pay a nutritionist to give a, a, a group talk, or I'm going to hire a nutritionist to put some educational material together and we'll put it on our parent group or something of that nature. I think like in my mind, that's been the most successful way to go about these because you shift the, the control to the athlete and to the parent about like, here are some things you can do. It's your responsibility to maybe read them and see how this fits into your life. Yeah, exactly. Again, kind of just defining the expectations and having that culture of, of learning in mm -hmm. the gym, because the things that they're saying and the things that they're learning about and hearing about, they don't end with gymnastics, right? Whether it's sleep hygiene, uh, nutrition habits, you know, all body image, all of this, it's not something that leaves when gymnastics ends. Like these are skills that we want our kids to have forever. And um, just being able to offer that support outside the gym, you know, here's what you can learn. Here's, here's things. And we're here to support you. Um, and we're here to help you and we're here to give you resources. Um, and you know, we don't have ex, you know, major expectations or rigid guidelines on how you implement mm. because everybody is clearly different and everybody is going to have, um, a different interpretation or a different home life, a different lifestyle. It's not going to look the same for everybody, but here's some advice you know, here's some information that you can, that we suggest, um, maybe part of your training. Mm. Yeah. And there's definitely one question I want to ask you as a follow-up is I, I hear this from a lot of coaches is that, you know, I understand and value nutrition. I understand and value sleep and recovery and stuff like that. And coaches are aware of it, but they really feel as though it's not their role. And I agree. I don't think it's their role to make any suggestions or offer things. They're like, this is the parent. Like the parent is the person who needs to do this. I can't control what food they eat. I can't control how much they sleep. I can't control all these things for coaches. I guess the first question I'll leave it at is like, where is the line between 
what a coach's responsibility is in nutrition and recovery and, you know, all that kind of stuff versus what is the parent's role in all this kind of stuff mm -hmm. best manage the athlete. Yeah, absolutely. And again, I think it really, really starts with education and culture from the beginning. Um, so making sure that the parents, the athletes and the coaches have access to the information and everyone is on the same page because nothing's more confusing for, you know, a young gymnast when they're seeing one thing and then the parent is saying a different thing and then the coach is doing something different. Um, but just having that education and making sure everyone is on the same page, just understanding the importance of it, right? The same way that we hold parents up to the expectation that, you know, they're going to drive their kids to practice on time and the way that they present themselves and carry themselves when we show up to a meet. Um, and again, we're not telling them exactly what to do. We're not telling them how to eat, but we're telling them that this is a part of the, the bigger picture um, mm. because really it's, it's not the coach's responsibility. Right. Um, when it comes to like nutrition, there is a dietitian that has done a lot of research in what they call um, the division of responsibility in feeding. I believe the dietitian is um, Ellen Satter. There's a ton of research. Um, and they talk a lot about the, the responsibility in building healthy eating habits really between like the child as they grow and as they age and the parent. But I think this model is, is really applicable to the gym and the gym situation too, because everybody has to be holding up their own end of the bargain. Everybody has to be um, playing, playing their role and not really overstepping because that's again, when things start to get a little funky. Mm. Right? So as a gymnast, right, of course they've got to be, invested in, in their ability and in responsibility, it varies by age. Mm. Um, you know, we can't expect a six-year-old or an eight-year-old to okay. be taking full responsibility of food. Um, you know, we, we can't really even be expecting that of 16-year-olds, but they can do and handle a lot more. Mm. Um, but it's, it's clearly their job to accept food. It is their job to eat when they're hungry. It's their job to stop eating when they're full to um, learn and grow and understand their body's signals, interpret their body's kind of biofeedback, what, what their body's telling them, um, that's really gonna serve them through life, right? Mm -hmm. Getting in touch with their body and learning. That's what this time is for, for them. Um, we've got to remember, even if they're you know a 17 year old elite gymnast, they're still a child. Mm. Right? There's, and, and they've got to enjoy their life as a child, of course, we want them to keep their their goals in the sport in mind, and especially depending on their goals, you know, where the line is drawn when it comes to to food and nutrition can be a little bit different. Right. Um, but allowing them to to have that experience, I think, is very very important. Mm. Um, you know, compared to the parents, who at this point they do they have the biggest role, right? They've, they've got to get food. They've got to prepare food. Um, a, the biggest thing that I see with parents and where a lot of them miss the mark is being, um, a good role model, right? Modeling healthy eating behaviors, right. um, having their own positive relationships with food, being encouraging. Um, I think that's, something a lot of parents miss because they've got their own stuff going on. They've got their own um, food rules, they've got their own, you know, maybe life issues, right? Everyone's got their own stuff, especially when it comes to food and nutrition. Yep. Um, so, you know, dealing with that. Um, but really, right, it's their, it's their job to be encouraging and communicate with their child in a non judgmental way and, and ask the tough questions and help them, right, grow that understanding and help them learn about food and how it fuels their body. Right. That's the that's the biggest piece. And I find so many parents miss out. Right. They're on kind of one of the two extremes. Either they're so caught up in their own stuff that it's rubbing off on their child and and their child is struggling, whether it's with a disordered eating, whether it's um, avoiding foods or on these very strict or restrictive diets um, or it's the other way. Right. Nutrition's just not a priority in the house and you know there's just not a lot of thought 
going into it. And again, that's not the child's fault. They are the product of their environment. But again, it really just goes back to education, making sure everybody's on the same page, right? It's just as important for a parent to prioritize food and nutrition, no matter what that looks like for their household, right. um, as it is to get their kid to sleep, to practice on time and make sure they're getting enough sleep before, you know, before practice or before meets. Mm. Um, yeah, I think I, I really want to continue this conversation. It's so important. And I want to kind of maybe hopefully give value to the coaches, then also the parents empathetically from both sides of the fence. But yeah, you, know you work with a lot of coaches, uh, consulting mm -hmm. and group talk. What are your, what, um, how do I frame this? What can you tell coaches on the best way to tactfully talk to their the parents about maybe some concerns they have? So maybe the athletes are low energy or something's going on where they look as though they're very tired all the time. And there is maybe a, a real concern for fueling properly. What, what do you give for advice for coaches who are like, hey, this is a problem. I can't just ignore it. But how do I tactfully talk to this parent about a concern that they might have with the athlete's performance? Absolutely. Again, I really think it starts with education. Um, if this is something that's been talked about in the gym before, mm. whether it's, um, you know, bringing somebody in on a regular basis, it's something that's been in the mo in the, um, the rule book that they sign or the code of conduct, whatever you have at your gym, yep. um, that they sign when they join the team, right? If it's something that's been in place from the get go and it's part of the culture, it's much, much less of a tough conversation sure. than if it's never been talked about at all. And it feels like it's coming out of the blue. Yeah. Um, I think for coaches, it is, you know, like we said, they've got a ton on their plate, but at the same time, it is probably part of their role to have a basic understanding of not only nutrition for athletes and nutrition for children to make sure that, you know, anything that they're saying kind of lines up and, and isn't going to be harmed harmful. Um, but also to be able to pick up on those red flags. Yeah. Um, and I think the biggest role of the coach really is to be the eyes and the ears for trouble. Mm. Um, so again, if that foundation is laid, it, the conversation is probably going to be much easier with the parent, um, than not. Yep. Then if, if that conversation hasn't happened before, um, if it's something that's never really been talked about, in your gym before, um, but you do need to approach a parent. I mean, the same way I would say that you would approach a parent about any other issue, right? Their, their knees really been bugging them. I don't, you know, I don't know if you've had a conversation with them or you've heard them talking about it or, you know, the same way that you would talk about, like you said, maybe like a move up or, um, just regular meetings, but just again, not talking about their body or their shape or anything like that, because that's not the direction for gymnastics. I really like to keep it performance based, uh, especially for a gymnast, right? That's kind of what they're most focused on. That's, that's what they're really seem to be caring about. Um, so just even saying, like you said, if I'm noticing their energy's not that great during practice, I'm noticing, right, they're a little bit sluggish when they come in. I've noticed, you know, they're having a hard time keeping up in their strength compared to the rest of the group. And there are a couple of reasons that this might be happening. Um, and I think it's, you know, worth a conversation just to see how they're stacking up with things like, you know, their sleep, their stress, their nutrition. Um, cause it, it doesn't have to be this big red flag. It doesn't have to be this big, scary topic. Um, it's not something that, you know, even if it's not an ideal situation for the kid, that the family has to overhaul their entire life, because that's what so many people think it is when you have the nutrition conversation, that they've got to go from, you know, whatever they're doing to, you know, meal prepping and cooking, you know, seven nights a week and only eating fruits and vegetables and never ordering takeout. Um, but just, you know, offering that support um, or offering the referral, mm. right? yeah. whether I think that's another big role of the coach um, is just saying, Hey, these are some things I'm noticing. These are some people you might consider talking to about it. Yeah, I absolutely love that. I think the things you said there are, are crucial, which is one is 
don't only talk about it when it's a problem. You know what I mean? Like it has to be, I like framing this conversation around all of recovery and all of like taking care of yourself, like maximizing gymnastics inside the gym by trying to maximize things outside the gym. So sleep quality, sleep hygiene, stress management, scheduling your life to make sure you have enough time, um, drinking enough water, fueling yourself throughout the day. Like you just organically wrap it up into a conversation about like, hey, how do we live a healthy lifestyle? And that way you're constantly talking about this all the time. And if something does come up as a red flag, which you know I've had a few instances where like you kind of notice something like, oh, wait a minute, this is, this is a little bit more outside the line. I can have the conversation with a parent, but like just noticing this, you know, just want to make sure we bring it up and kind of address it. I don't know why, but maybe it's worth a conversation um, with your son or daughter about this. And that leads to my next question is how do you advise parents? I mean, a lot of times either the parent sees these things themselves. They see like, you know, some moodiness or some low energy or something of that nature, or a gymnast maybe is going through puberty and is starting to vocalize, you know, like certain things about the way they look or the way they feel. And the parent starts to become very uncomfortable because they want to help but they don't know how to help and they don't know how to start that conversation about working with someone or thinking about uh, you know, sleep and recovery and nutrition. So what are you giving to advice for parents who maybe have teenage athletes who are going through something that they're struggling with? Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think, like you said, laying the foundation is always important because it's much easier to have that conversation if it's an ongoing conversation than bringing it up for the first time ever when it's already an issue. Um, first, yeah, like you said, for so long nutrition, it seemed very like after the fact, like, okay, I'm already severely injured or I've already got some disordered eating. Let's backtrack mm. when it should be a preventative conversation. So we never get to that point in the first place. Um, but you know, for these parents and these gymnasts, just having that conversation all the time of that gymnasts are unique. And I think the more exposure that we have to gymnastics, I think whether it's through television or social media, we really see this. Like, you know, you watch an NCAA meet and you've got a variety of gymnasts that you can identify, that anyone could really identify with. Um, so just having that understanding and that foundation that there's no such thing as a gymnast body and you can do gymnastics looking any certain way. Um, I think digging into the why is also really, really important. Um, a lot of times you don't even get that surface level, right? You've got to ask why. I think, what is it, at least three times, if not five times, to really keep digging in and figuring out, okay, you know, why am I not happy with my body? Why do I no longer like my stomach? Like, why am I thinking about changing the way that I'm eating? Like, what is the intention behind that? Because like I, like I said before, a lot of times it actually has absolutely nothing to do with body image and it has nothing to do with food and it has, you know, very little to do with nutrition. Not saying that it shouldn't be an important part of the conversation, but sometimes it, it digs a lot deeper into the mental health side of things. Mm -hmm. um, and that's more helpful yeah. than, than a nutrition conversation. Um, and just figuring out why, okay, like, why are you feeling this way? What are you, what are we really struggling with? What is the true problem we're trying to solve? Um, a lot of times, you know, overhauling nutrition doesn't actually solve the problem that you think it does, especially if you do it without professional help and you just think, okay, I'm going to give up sugar and eat clean or change my diet completely. Right? It usually backfires. Mm. Um, and then at that point, again, having the idea that you can work with a professional, that you don't have to know it all, even as a parent, yeah. right? your expertise is in parenting and your expertise is in yourself and your family. Right. and your child. And a lot of times like the gymnasts, they don't want to hear this from their parents. It, it sticks more or they feel they seem more motivated when it comes from somebody else. I've mm -hmm. had that so much conversation with parents so many times like I that they say I can't have this conversation with my kid anymore. Somebody else needs to do it. Yep. Um, so bringing in that professional, um bringing in somebody else that can have these conversations with your gymnast and and be a neutral party, right? Mm -hmm. There, 
there's no conflict of interest, right? They're not invested. Of course, they want your, we want your gymnast to succeed, but we're not invested in, you know, this meet this weekend. We're invested in happy, healthy humans, and we're invested in the long-term success and the health and well-being, not just physically, but mentally. So bringing in somebody. And then I think, you know, with that professional, making sure you're setting realistic expectations for yourself. Again, that goes back to the body shape and the body image conversation that all gymnasts are unique um, and trying to fit yourself into a box that you're not meant to fit in is always going to do more harm than good. Yep. Yeah, those are fantastic points. And I can't even, I can't begin to agree more that I think uh, in my experience, I'm not a parent, but in, in seeing athletes that I've coached or work with that have struggled with this and seeing who kind of really has a successful outcome is the parent is able to role model a variety of things. One of which is being, they admit and they accept and they work on themselves from a mental and a, an emotional point of view is that they are willing and able to demonstrate, you know, let's dig into this and figure out the root cause of maybe why my, my healthy lifestyle, maybe I'm too stressed. Maybe I'm working a lot. Maybe I have some priorities juggled that I need to really think about how much I'm doing. And when they are willing and able to dig into those layers of mental health themselves, but then also dig into their own healthy lifestyle habits and change, it makes a really positive impact on the athlete because, you know, that's their kid. And they see like, wow, my mom or dad is willing to, you know, not only want to learn more and change, but they're actually going to do this, you know, a little bit alongside me. I think that it provides the environment for a lot of success. Um, but I think something that's often lost on parents that I as the neutral observer, as a coach, some MC is like, they actually never ask the athlete if they want help or like, if they want to get involved with a professional, they literally just like almost force it, you know, or they almost mm -hmm. like assume the person wants to do it. And it has to be something that, as we all know, the athlete has to be the one who initiates change. The athlete has to be someone who initiates, you know, wanting to learn more, do something. So it's different between like, um, Hey, you know, this nutritionist who came to the gym, you know, she seemed really nice. I bought you, I bought you a, a consultation package. Like it's next week. Like that's like, Whoa, that's terrifying for an athlete versus like, Hey, uh, you know, the coach mentioned to me, you were super tired. And I know we've, we've always talked about wanting to work with someone to get that up. Is that something you're interested in? You know, let me know, you know, and you kind of put the ball in their court. And I think from your perspective, do you see as though people are more receptive when it goes about that way? Or is that something they still struggle with? Oh, 100%. Um, whether it's gymnast or not, food is really, really personal. Um, and I can't tell anyone how to eat, right? Because I'm not you. I don't live your life. I don't know your preferences. I don't, you know, I don't know your your family situation. Right? I can't I can't tell you how to eat. Um, and that's something that I really find important in the way that I have the conversations with gymnasts. I am never going to tell them they can or can't eat any certain food. Um, cause I personally believe that you can feel your body eating just about anything. Um, especially as you build those, those, um, that introspection and are able to reflect and learn how food feels in your body. But yeah, the biggest thing is helping them draw those connections. Um, and to, you know, some of the things they might be struggling with and then some of the possible solutions to that but yes it always has to come from themselves which is why i find especially for young kids just putting them on a meal plan never works mm. right? you've got to sit down and you've got to have this conversation not just say eat this because i said so right okay let's try something like this because you said you were struggling with this you know this is where the professional comes in right in my experience i have seen that you know this could possibly help with that what ideas do you have? Mm. What do you think about that? Right? What kinds of snacks would you like to bring to the gym? Right? If you if you had to put a fruit on your breakfast plate, what would you want to put on it? Right? Again, putting the ball in their court because it's it's exactly the same as in the gym. If they're not motivated, or if their goals have changed, or if they're not aligned, then you're not going to get the most out of them. They're not going to be happy. They're not going to comply. They're not going to do what they're expected to do mm. so it's definitely got to come yeah from within and and from the gymnast yeah I, very important and even on that it was like a sparked into my mind as you said that is like having 
you know, a healthy relationship with food and being able to obviously try to take care of yourself and live well. But I think sometimes it actually is the opposite is that, you know, athletes or other people. And again, I don't have kids, but this is just, there's been athletes who tell me, they look up to me for the way that I maybe interact with, with my food and my lifestyle and health and working out. And sometimes it's not that they see me eating clean all the time or like being perfect. They actually see me enjoy pieces of pizza and just be like, yeah, you know, like I'm enjoying this with my friends. Like I ate a whole plate of nachos the other night, like and having a healthy relationship myself with food. I think sometimes I hear that story from parents too, is like they go overboard with very, very healthy, very, very perfect eating. And there's never any wiggle room. And if they do have family pizza night or if they have something when they go out, you know, they see their parents having a tough relationship with those, you know, not clean foods, quote unquote. And that leads to equals nuts problems. So it's about role modeling. Yeah, you want to feel yourself well. You want to take care of yourself. I should work out myself. I should be conscious of this, but in a healthy way that's realistic. That's not crazy standards on that. And they say like, oh, like, well, well we can have pizza sometimes. We can go out and do stuff and have ice cream. And I think the gymnast internalize that as like, I'm allowed to do this. It feels like I can have anything in moderation when I want it. And please correct me if I'm wrong, but that's my interpretation from the outside. No, I, I absolutely agree. And I have this conversation with gymnasts and I have this conversation with parents all the time and especially parents and coaches, especially coaches that came up through the gymnastics world. Everybody's got their own stuff that you may or may not realize, right? Diet culture, is so pervasive, not just in the sport of gymnastics, but everywhere. Um, just because something is common doesn't make it normal. Mm. So, right, having having to even if it if you're not perfect, but like you said, seeing that you're working on yourself, seeing that their parents are working on themselves, gives them permission as well to be okay with where they're at, where they're at, while still having goals to strive for. Mm -hmm. Um, And I I think it's important. I just think it's like lost on people that they need to practice not I hate practice what you preach. I hate that idea. But I hate just like, Mm -hmm. live like a normal human. (laughs) You know what I mean? Like, be a normal human who has, you know, food they enjoy eating, and that's fine. They work out, they're taking care of themselves. But sometimes they miss a day. Sometimes it doesn't work out. Sometimes something happens, you know, Mm -hmm. like, okay, you know, I'll get back on track tomorrow or something of that nature. Yeah, gymnasts like we like to think that they're robots, but they're not, right? We're we're all human and having those realistic expectations set for yourself and giving yourself permission to be human. I think our gymnasts again so often they're holding themselves up to this this perfectionist standard, right? Everything has to be perfect all the time and if it's not like I don't know what I'll do or you you start to see see the the wheels kind of fall off when things don't go exactly as planned. But living somewhere in the gray, right? It's not always black, it's not always white, but living somewhere in the gray is always gonna get you further in the long haul. And we forget that in gymnastics because we're always striving for perfection. But especially when it comes to nutrition, if there's no such thing as a perfect diet. And if somebody tells you they have a perfect diet, they're lying. <laughs> right. They're not telling you about the mental struggles. They're not telling you about the late night eating or the binges or what happens when they go to a party or on vacation and, and they can't obtain that standard again. Right. There's no such thing as a perfect diet. You are going to get further if you, you know, shoot for that middle ground, that like 80 percent most days mm. right? after days and weeks and months. You're going to be further down the line than if you weren't a hundred percent for three days and gave up. Right. right. You've always got to find realistic expectations. Um, I'm really big on setting small goals and celebrating the little wins, um, finding little things that work for you, you know, and learning, even learning from the things that didn't go so well, right? You tried something and it didn't work. Okay. Let's try something else. It's not the end of the world. You didn't fail. You can't fail at nutrition. Hmm. Right? You either try it and you like it and it worked or it didn't and you try something else. Yep. Yeah, I think all those things are, I'm happy that you're, you're pointing out these things. I think a lot of people have a fallacy of perfection. They have a fallacy of, you know, having to be on all the time. They can't indulge in vacations. They can't go out to parties with their friends or stuff like that. And something else we tried really hard to, or I didn't try, Sarah, 
circle so wonderfully portrayed in the film was i think there's this uh misconception in our culture now that like you look at like the 80s the 90s the weigh-ins the crazy stuff the the dieting and like all these insanely dangerous practices that happened and you think like oh well you know that was then it's not really happening anymore we don't weigh kids anymore so there's nothing going wrong like kids don't struggle with this it's really something we shouldn't worry about and I don't know. I, I, don't, I think that's that couldn't be farther from the truth. I think it's actually gotten more intense. I think it's like some of the practices that we know are wrong and immoral have gone away. But the presence of how many kids struggle with it is still really, really uh, high because of social media's influences and, and other things of that nature. So I'm curious to ask if you think there are things, you know, in the culture that you blatantly see when you talk to Jim as you work with, you consult with that people think are not problems are not really issues, but you know, in your heart as a nutritionist, like these are still very present and very real and we have to deal with them yeah i absolutely agree i think the harm is much less outward um i think you you're still going to go into gyms and, and see scales there's still some of that but it's much fewer and further between than it was even you know 10 or 15 years ago i think the issue is it is a lot more sneaky and it like i was saying the difference between common and normal some mm -hmm. of the things may seem very, very common, whether it's in gymnastics itself or whether it's just in our culture in general, right? Diet culture's influence is deep. So, you know, we're still hearing of gyms that have very strict food policies, right? No snacks during practice. Um, you know, if, if you've got a kid who's got a birthday, right, and they want to bring in a treat, they're only allowed to bring in like fruit tray, right? No cupcakes for your birthday. Um, nothing other than water, still having to ask water for permission to get water in the middle of practice. Um, these conversations of, you know, clean eating, um, eliminating foods and food groups and being on certain diets, right? There's so much talk, whether it's, you know, from coach to coach, it's from parent to parent, it's going on in the gym, it's going on at home. The kids are hearing it, they're seeing it. Um, and it's so commonplace in our culture that we forget that it's not normal, that mm. all of that is actually very, very disordered. Mm. You know, the food obsession, the, the elimination, the restriction, the cycle of guilt and, you know, it's very, very disordered. It's still happening. It's still going on. Um, it's just a lot more sneaky. You know, I've heard everything from coaches saying, we only order small leotards, like size small, you have to fit into a size small. And it's like, that is unrealistic. Like, why are we they have they have a range of sizes for these leotards for a reason. We don't question their height, we don't question their foot size, their eye color. Like, why are we trying to fit them all into a small Leo? Um, I've even had gymnasts say things like um, the belly bands, that are meant for posture have been really triggering and was the start of um, of a downward spiral, even as young as like six or seven. Um, just some of the words that we use. And again, it's it's not always intentional, but like, you know, I've, I've heard coaches say things like, you know, suck in your gut instead of pull your ribs up. Like, you know, very, very different phrasing can cause a kid to now become hyper aware of their body or things like that. So I think it's it's much sneakier, but it's definitely still there. It's definitely still pervasive. There's a lot more education within the community mm. calling these things out and realizing like it's okay to allow your kids to have a snack in the middle of a four hour practice. Right? They're not gonna be poisoned if they brought a Gatorade to practice. Um, these, these things are, are okay. And as we have conversations, you know, it becomes more and more okay. And more coaches are allowing these things and, and normalizing these things. Um, and it's just got to continue. I think the last big thing that I see is, um, kind of just going back to how gymnastics has just been a closed circle for so long and everybody has their people, right, and their referrals. And there are still um, some non-credentialed professionals 
working in gymnastics and, and with gymnastics basically based off of their reputation or who they know um, versus what they know. And it's still very dangerous because they're talking a lot of what they're saying is very outdated mm. and it's causing, it's still causing harm, um, whether they realize it or not. Um, and I think that's another thing is just do your research with your professionals, um, the people that you're referring to, the people that you're bringing in on your team. You know, of course, we want to, we always want to refer our our friends and our, our former gymnasts and other people within the community. But there are, are really some great people in across the medicine community and, and across the field that not only have now the understanding of gymnastics, but also the education background. Um, so just continuing to move away from that reputation and, and more towards the science. Yeah, this is something where um, I went through this, unfortunately, and had a little bit of a face palm moment. But unless you are a full time credentialed professional uh, registered dietitian reading scientific evidence by the day by the week, like you probably know very, very little about nutrition at a, at a proper scientific level. And um, I think that sometimes, unfortunately, well intentioned coaches, medical providers, parents, believe that they are giving out good information. And then you look at like the literature about how much either it's just so wildly complex, or also what has really fallen out of favor as we learn more about, you know, you know, very advanced studies and science has come out, like, you really probably don't know a lot, <laughs> not in a mean way, but like, you need to be working with someone in the same way that like, I wouldn't just guess how to fix my tires on my car. You know, I wouldn't yeah. just like, try to figure out how to how to build something and like yeah we'll see if this works i think it's the same thing with nutrition like you can't just kind of know and be like yeah well i read this in an article or like you know this parent group they were talking a lot about how carbs you shouldn't have those or like something in this hair and i think that's the humility to realize like in the moment when something comes up you're like hmm well yeah i don't know i actually don't know about this so let's find someone who has the credentialing for it who was a gymnast who works in gymnastics there's plenty of great people like yourself and others online now that are offering services it's like Let's let's read up and see what they have to say instead of me giving you a half kind of la di da answer and possibly leading you down a dangerous path. Yeah, I absolutely agree. And the other piece of too is like, so I don't know how to. I mean, you can attack you can attack the subject the delicate way, the proper way. But there's definitely from questions I hear is like, I get it. I don't want to talk about bodies. I don't want to talk about weight. That's not what I'm going to. However, this sport demands a certain amount of power to mass ratio to be successful. And, you know, I'm trying to help the athletes get to their goals of high level skills and make progress. You know, the gymnast has expressed to me, they would like to change their body composition or they want to feel more powerful. Um, I guess this is not for the coaches to do it, but so say there are athletes or gymnasts or parents who have kids like this, that do actually want to make a change in their body composition or strength, weight ratios and stuff. How does someone approach that conversation in a safe way? And then how do you approach, doing that in a safe way i mean obviously work with you and a professional but I'm, I'm curious about how to help coaches like be like all right well like i don't even know how to attack this conversation yeah absolutely like you said it, it definitely starts with working with professionals it stems from digging into that why and having realistic expectations um of yourself and of your body right um if you're not someone that packs on muscle mass and you're trying to get really, really big, like, okay, having, having this realistic conversation, or if, if you're someone who's like, just comes from a, a larger, you know, bigger family and you're trying to change your body to be really skinny or really tiny, um, you know, it's, it's an, it's unrealistic. Um, so just making sure the expectations are unrealistic because in all honesty, Every gymnast is going to have their optimal body composition, their yeah. optimal strength to power ratio. Um, I'm not even going to use the term weight because I don't think that even really plays into the conversation, right? And they're going to they're going to have this optimal composition when they are well trained, well rested, well fueled, well taken care of, right? And they are probably not going to reach that until after puberty. Mm. Um, that composition is unique for everyone, right? We can kind of be predictive in looking at things like their genetics, their family, their growth charts, right? Their own kind of 
personal picture, but we can't predict it. I can't tell you what that number on the scale is going to say, or I can't tell you how much natural muscle you're going to be able to put on. Um, a phrase that I really like um, to talk, to use, weight is not a behavior, right? It's not something that we can outwardly change. Right? You can do all the right things and your weight might not change. You could do all the wrong things and your weight might change, right? It's, it's not something we can outwardly control. But again, have, finding those, the intention behind it, right? And working on the behaviors, saying, okay, you're trying to get a bit stronger, right? Let's look at your nutrition. Let's make sure we're optimizing, you know, the way that you're fueling. Are you eating enough? Are you getting enough protein? Are you getting enough vitamins and minerals? Are you scheduling your, your meals and timing your meals around training as best as possible, right? Can we optimize it that way, right? And if you put on more muscle mass, then that's great. If you don't put on a single ounce of muscle mass, but you feel 10 times stronger in the gym, did we not just achieve the same exact goal? Mm -hmm. um, I very rarely talk about weight because it's honestly not, it's not a goal. It, for very few people, it's not the realistic goal. If they are fueling themselves appropriately, if they're training appropriately, if they're taking care of themselves appropriately, their body is gonna settle at the most optimal place for for them. They're gonna feel better in the gym. They're gonna feel themselves getting stronger. They're gonna feel their skills getting easier. They're gonna feel themselves gaining endurance and getting faster. And that's what I like to focus on, right? How is your training? How is your energy? Um, and having those conversations and making those connections is a little more realistic mm. than getting on the scale every single week because at the end of the day, we can't always anticipate that. We can't change that. And if your goal at the end of the day is to get stronger, it doesn't matter what that number says if you're getting stronger. Not to mention, as I've learned, how ridiculous the fluctuations in weight can be day to day, week to week, even when you mm -hmm. are doing everything right, quote unquote. Like um, the first time I had a big realization was this was a couple of years ago when I, I ran a very long distance, like woke up in the morning and it was more of an experience myself because I had processed some of the things that I'd gone through with weight, but I woke up, hadn't done anything yet, gone to the bathroom and I was a certain weight. I went for a run and I was five pounds lighter and then I, you know, it was a long run. So I refueled myself and then that night I was 10 pounds net heavier in the morning. Yeah. So literally in 20, not even 24 hours in 18 hours, I went from like 10 pound fluctuation up and down. And I was like, Jesus, I didn't even like change anything. <laughs> like I can't imagine. Yeah. No, no, right? your body doesn't gain fat mass or muscle mass that quickly, right? Most people can only gain, what is it between a half and a pound of muscle like per month. Mm -hmm. And that's on the, that's on the heavy weightlifting yeah. side of things and the bodybuilding side of things. Um, your body's not going to just automatically turn a big meal into fat mass and it's not automatically going to um you know be like oh she dieted for one day let me lose her five pounds right you're seeing fluid shifts you're you're literally seeing the weight of the food mm. right if you were to stand on a scale and then you were to stand on a scale with a 16 ounce bottle of water right your your body weight's going to go up by 16 ounces right. right there's no difference if you were holding that bottle or if you had drank that bottle yeah. the mass is still on the scale that that says nothing about anything other than the fact that you put physically more mass <laughs> on the scale yeah exactly yeah and you and kind of i guess wrapping this conversation into the the positive side is that you mentioned some things that are really just not healthy to do which is either like mass elimination of one food group or restriction or uh, there's something else you mentioned i forget but are there things that you know you can't always generalize but in general are not healthy practices to do, whether it's the living by the scale or cutting on a food group or, you know, that kind of idea. Cause I think a lot of people are like, all right, I get it. You know, what things should I be aware of as those red flags? If I see those happening in athletes that I know or work with, or, you know, maybe if I'm listening to this podcast and I realize that maybe I need to change some of the habits that I am reflective of. Yeah. I mean, I think you hit the nail on the head. Um, when, when things start become becoming a little bit obsessive, um, so yeah, cutting out foods, cutting out entire food groups, trying to change your entire way of eating, 
Um, if you're a parent and you're no, you're noticing this in your child, right there, they've all of a sudden started changing their meals, right? They're, they used to be a big breakfast eater and now they're just grabbing an apple or they're going from one extreme to another, skipping meals, skipping snacks. If you're noticing they're moody, they're exhausted, they're injury, they're getting injured all the time. Um, you know, some of these can definitely be red flags. Mm. One thing I meant to say before, and I think it's, it's definitely not a coincidence. Um, but for so, cause for so long, this conversation has been ignored in gymnastics. You know, what we always see as the mid season grind, right. Mm. Where you're just tired all the time. You're apathetic. You're, you're frustrated. You're sore. The little injuries creep up, like all these things. Yep. There's no coincidence that those symptoms align pretty perfectly with red S. Yep. Right. And there, there's no coincidence. Um, that extra intensity of, of whether it's even season or summer training and, and you've ticked up the hours or anything like that, or just, you know, a small change in diet, right? You know, I'm, I'm trying to eat a little bit healthier. So I'm going to swap my usual, you know, sandwich for lunch for a plain salad, right? That little, little change right there can be enough to kind of push you over the edge. It's very, very well said. I think that's another thing that people believe that red S is rare. It doesn't happen to most people. It's like you have to be in a hospital and dying for it to be something that's concerning. But like, I see a lot of kids who live at a low level red S um, thing, mm -hmm. because all these things we've talked about. And it's not like it's just some pig to do where they're like, you know, I can't believe this is happening. I, you know, I noticed they're exhausted all the time. It's like very low level. They're just burning at an under underlying red S syndrome. And people think that it's nothing when in reality, it's a huge problem behind the scenes. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's way more commonplace, I think, than anybody realizes. And those are the signs, right? You said they're like exhausted, tired, moody, you know, injuries just never go away. I'm constantly getting chronic injuries. Those are signs of deeper problems. Mm -hmm. And we just associate them with season with comp this, this time is competition season, right? It's the grind. Got to mm -hmm. make it through when in reality, okay, maybe, maybe it's not just that. Yeah. Yeah. And I can tell you on the injury side, there's many times when I've been like third stress fracture, huh? Hmm. Wow. That's a, that's not a coincidence. Let's maybe have a conversation here about like recovery practices or sleeping practices or overtraining. And I think on the medical side, which mimics a lot of red S stuff is people just assume like gymnastics is dangerous stuff happens. And like, yes, it does. You roll your ankle, your grip slips. Like I get that, but like 90% of some of these injuries are chronic overuse, very slow, progressive. And then like, you know, like one floor pass, like, oh, just like that one floor pass, like, nah, that was probably like the 37, you know, floor passes that were mm -hmm. leading up, that slowly were ticking down that tolerance or those last couple extra hours where you were really crushing someone in conditioning and didn't think critically about fueling and periodization to have a, a, a break mm -hmm. right there or something of that nature. Yeah, that was my downfall for sure. Yeah, was it? <laughs> oh, yeah. I was bit by the injury bug and never recovered. You know, I, I would personally say I had a very good training experience, especially through J.O. But again, it was it was just doing what we knew. It was not periodized. It was just, you know, 100 percent all the time. We never had these conversations. We didn't have strength coaches. We if we saw a PT, it was like somebody covered by insurance. There was there was no gymnastics consideration. There was definitely no nutrition conversation. Um, and I thoroughly believe that if we had these teams surrounding us, we would have all fared a heck of a lot better. Yeah. That's something I think a lot about, which is how much, how much is truly the sport is hard and difficult, which it is versus what is, there's a lot better ways we could optimize the experience and how hard it, it has to be versus the reality. Like it's going to be hard no matter what. Oh we yeah. Make it exponentially harder when we don't have a team of people around the kids to help, whether it's physicians, mental health, sports psychologists. And again, I think it goes back to, we ask too much of coaches sometimes to do all these things. And we're like, Oh, well, I guess gymnastics is hard. Like gymnastics is dangerous. Injuries happen. Like this is what it is. You're supposed to get tired. You're supposed to have cranky ankles. Like it's, it, we just have to stop assuming that what, the normal acceptance rate of, of this is burnout injuries, nutrition, eating disorders is, is okay. Like you said, like what's normal is not always healthy. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this is fantastic. I could talk a lot more about this, but I don't, <laughs> I don't want to make this 
podcast so long, people start to break it up too much. So uh, tell people where they can find you and what do you have going on and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, absolutely. So I am on Facebook and Instagram at the gymnast RD. And I also have a Facebook community for parents and coaches as well, where we go into some more of these issues from the parents and coaches side. Um, I do uh, team nutrition workshops. And I, I guess when this comes out, we'll be trying to get some stuff on the calendar for the summer. So either virtually or locally. Um, and then I do one on one nutrition, uh, coaching and counseling for gymnasts. Perfect. Yeah. So everyone should definitely check out yourself website and all that kind of stuff. I think the, I think every single human, I mean, honestly, but every definitely one master should be working with some sort of professional to learn more about this stuff and figure out where they can improve. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Carrie, thanks so much for coming on. I appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you.